All right, in our fourth installment for chapter nine, we are now going to introduce that second reaction that's mentioned in the chapter title, which is the elimination reaction. Just like substitutions, there are two types of eliminations we're going to get in this chapter. Okay. We are going to start with the E2, which stands for elimination by molecular, the two, right? And then we'll, in the next video, get E1. Uh, so now with an elimination reaction, we are eliminating groups from the molecule. They're getting removed. Okay. So previously we saw substitution, something got replaced. Okay. You've seen this slide before. Now we have an elimination. We've lost the leaving group. We've lost a neighboring hydrogen. Okay. And in doing so, we form a new double bond. So make sure you remember these types of reactions and what they produce. Right? The product of an elimination reaction is an alkene. And right now in chapter nine, we're just dealing with halogens as the leaving group. We'll see other things later on. Yeah. Now, right as I mentioned just a second ago, E2 stands for elimination by molecular. Yeah. So if we look at the overall reaction here, you can determine from the kinetic information that it's a one-step reaction. So try and use that to think about the mechanism. Uh, bimolecular, it's dependent on both the concentration of the alkyl halide and the base uh, for the transition state in the rate limiting step. That means they're both involved. Have both the alkyl halide and the base in this case. Okay. Hydroxide previously in the substitution, we would have been thinking about it as a nucleophile, but now it's taking away a hydrogen. So we're thinking about it acting like a base. So what does that mechanism look like? Okay. Your base comes in and pulls off your neighboring hydrogen. Okay. So a hydrogen that's right next door to the leaving group. Okay. As that is being pulled off and that bond is breaking, the electron density is shifting over to form the pi bond. All at the same time, as a concerted reaction, your leaving group is being eliminated. So this bond's breaking, a new pi bond is forming, and then we have a bond that's forming as well between oxygen and hydrogen. Okay. So two things involved here. It's for following second order kinetics overall. Okay. And that should make sense, right? That bromine has to be eliminated. Your leaving group has to depart at the same time and because otherwise you would have a Texas carbon here with five bonds, which can't happen. Okay. Now, some notation is important. Okay. Your new pi bond is formed here, right? Right, going to the carbon that had the leaving group. That carbon here that is directly bonded to the leaving group is called an alpha carbon. I right? see the notation here. So dealing with halogens as leaving groups in chapter nine. The carbon that's directly bonded to the halogen is the alpha carbon. Exactly one sigma bond away is what's called a beta carbon. And a hydrogen comes off of the beta carbon. Okay? The leaving group departs the alpha carbon. And, and it's possible to have multiple beta carbons. If I jump back a slide here, right? This is a beta carbon, that's a beta carbon, that's a beta carbon. So we'll talk about which one actually loses the hydrogen here in just a second. Okay. Note what this type of reaction is called overall, in case you see this elsewhere, the dehydrohalogenation. Okay. So D, you're losing hydro, hydrogen, halogen right there in the name. Right. So removal of a halogen and a proton at the same time, dehydrohalogenation, also known as a beta elimination or a one-two elimination, yeah, in case you see those notations anywhere, beta elimination or one-two elimination. Yeah. Now these reactions, as I just alluded to, are regioselective. Right. Remember what that term regioselective means. It preferentially forms more of one or when you have a variety of constitutional isomers that are possible, right? You're preferentially forming one of them. So with two beta carbons in this case, there are two carbons that are bonded to the hydrogens that could possibly be lost, right? One of these hydrogens here, 
or the ones that are over here. It's just as easy to remove either hydrogen. Okay. But the major product is going to be the most stable alkene. Okay? And remember those rules for stability right, from the beginning of Orgo 1, Chapter 5, right? stability of alkenes. The more substituted something is, the more stable it is. So over here, with one alkyl group attached to each of our carbons on either side of the alkene, versus over here, this carbon has no alkyl groups, and this one just has one, and this is more substituted and therefore more stable. Okay. And it all comes down to the stability of the transition state. If we look at the reaction coordinate diagram, right, the more stable alkene is the major product because it goes through a more stable transition state meaning it's lower in energy, meaning there's a smaller energy barrier to overcome. It's easier to form. And if we take a look at the transition state, right, you can see that the one on the left here with the more stable alkene is more stable overall. And transition state is formed more easily. And that rule for quickly predicting what's going to be the more stable alkene has a name as well. It's called Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule is used for elimination reaction. It tells you that the more substituted alkene is obtained from an elimination reaction when you pull a hydrogen off of whatever beta carbon is bonded to the fewest hydrogens. And so it's kind of like the direct opposite of Markovnikov. Right? Markovnikov told us for a addition reaction, right? add the hydrogen, the electrophile, to whatever carbon had the most hydrogens, the rich get richer. They said, flip it around, the poor get poorer. Whichever one was bonded to the fewest hydrogens loses a hydrogen. That's because that results in the most stable alkene. Okay. So looking over here, right? Beta carbon, beta carbon, beta carbon. Right? But this one has the fewest hydrogens two versus three and three. So it loses a hydrogen for your major product here. Okay. Same thing on the bottom. So your major product is the more stable alkene, which is usually the one that's more substituted. But there are a couple of exceptions to Zaitsev's rule. Your book calls them limitations. Yeah. Because Zaitsev is just gonna tell you to form the one that's more substituted quickly following that rule. But you, there are a couple of things that you have to look out for. Okay, So make sure you have a list in your notes of exceptions, these limitations to Zaitsev's rule. Because yeah. Zaitsev is always going to give you the one that's more substituted. <clears throat> but if delocalized electrons are in play, you always have to stop and check yourself. Look for dienes. Look for benzene rings. Yeah. Because if conjugation is at play, right? look at the major products here and here. Those maintain a conjugated system. Right? Remember, double bond, single bond, double bond, right? Double, single, double, double, single, double. Right? Those are more stable. Zaitsev would predict the one on the right, but conjugation is going to give you the major product in this situation. So make sure you look out for that. That's one exception, delocalized electrons. Another limitation of Zaitsev's rule is if you have a really bulky base, <clears throat> the bulkier the base, uh, the more that it's going to form the less stable alkene. See how this is the less stable alkene and it's the major product here? Okay, because this is so bulky, it can't really get in there and access the beta carbon that's bonded to the fewest hydrogens like Zaitsev tells us to. Okay, it's just going to go for the ones that are easily accessible on the end. Okay, so the sterics of the base and the sterics of the alkyl halide too also plays in a factor. Steric hindrance can really affect the major product of the reaction. So that's exception number two to Zaitsev. If you have a bulky base like terputoxide here, uh, that's gonna form the less substituted alkene. Uh, you can see that in this table right here, right? As these bases get bigger, look at how much of the less stable alkene they form. 
which, you know, it depends what you're looking for. That might be advantageous. If you're trying to form the less stable alkene, that tells you if you're doing this in the lab, you need to use a bulky base. Okay, so that's exception number two. One more thing to consider, be on the lookout for, alkyl fluorides. Okay? If fluoride is your leaving group, you form the less substituted, the less stable alkene. I right? see that one pentene at 70% when fluoride is the leaving group. If this was chlorine or bromine or iodine over here, two pentene would be the major product. But when you have an alkyl fluoride, you form the less stable alkene because the transition state is different. Yeah. Because that's a bad leaving group, right, remember iodide's the best leaving group amongst the halogens, fluoride's the worst. Yeah. So bad leaving group, it's hard to break that bond. It gives us a carbanion-like transition state. Yeah. And carbanions don't wanna be substituted. Yeah. The more substituents you have on a carbanion, the less stable it is. So here we wanna have the carbanion on the end versus in the middle. And that's why this is a more stable transition state which leads to the less substituted alkene. Okay, because carbanion stability is the opposite of carbocations, which is what this slide shows you. That's because those carbanions are destabilized by electron donating groups, polar opposite of carbocations. And again, summarized here in table 9.5, notice as we go, right, from iodide, the best leaving group, gives us the greatest yield of the more stable alkene. Going to bromine and chlorine, we're still getting predominantly the more substituted alkene, right, but to a lesser degree, but fluoride is a really bad leaving group. And then notice the switch. Now we're getting the less stable product. So three factors to look out for, right? Delocalized electrons, bulky bases, and fluoride as a leaving group. Those are where Zaitsev's rule will not work for you, okay. which is stated here on this summary slide, 77. Okay. How about our relative reactivities? One slide to leave off of for our E2 reactions. Okay. Tertiary alkyl halides are more reactive than secondary are more reactive than primary. Okay. Why? Because when we look at the products, right, they lead to a higher substituted alkene, okay, which is why we see tertiary alkyl halides be the most reactive, the most substituted, most stable product, followed by secondary, followed by primary. So those are lots of factors to pay attention to for E2 reactions. First, know how to predict what the product is going to be, the alkene, then know the mechanism, then know Zaitsev's rule, and the three exceptions that we just talked about. Lots of factors for these E2 reactions, and then in our next video, part five, we'll talk about E1 reactions and how they're a little bit different.